Okay, so here we are back with the skeleton and this time we're just going to be looking at the vertebral column. And you need to know the sort of regions of the vertebral column, the uh, functions of the various bits of the vertebral column and what the vertebrae look like in each part of the vertebral column. So, the first seven vertebrae of the vertebral column are the cervical uh, vertebrae. And they're effectively your neck bones. We then come into the uh, thoracic, so from the word thorax, actually it's from the ancient Greek meaning breastplate. So the thorax vertebrae run from 1 to 12, and those are the ones that articulate, that means move against the ribs. So that's where the ribs are attached. And then we've got the lumbar vertebrae down here, these are your lower back vertebrae, they're mainly designed for sort of strength and being able to keep your body nice and upright. Your next set of vertebrae are fused vertebrae, so you've got the sacral plate or the sacrum. This is actually formed of five vertebral bones that are all fused together. And then we've got the coccyx, which is our vestigial tailbone, uh, which is just four little vertebrae all fused together. So, without further ado, you need to really focus on the cervical, the thoracic and the lumbar vertebrae and you need to know their sort of structures. So our basic vertebral structure is in two parts. We've got what we call the body of the vertebra. Uh, so that is, uh, on the skeleton, that's these bits here, so, uh, separated by the vertebral discs. And then we've got the arch, which here is coloured blue for you, which are the bits kind of behind that body. In addition, the arch has, so the vertebral body is always just called the vertebral body, but there are various parts to the vertebral arch. So, sort of attaching uh, the, the arch to the body, we've got these bits called the pedicels. These are the bits coloured for you in green here. Attached to those, sort of sticking out from those are the transverse processes. So on our skeleton, These are the transverse processes that are sticking out on each side. It's not doing very well. Uh, the articular processes, uh, we've got two sets of articular processes. We've got the superior ones at the top and the inferior ones at the bottom. And those just articulate with the next vertebra up in the column. We then have the lamina, which um, just connects the, the pedicel and forms that bit of the arch there, which supports the spinous process. And in general, these spinous processes are to attach uh, things to like your muscles and your ligaments. So these spinous processes are really quite sturdy structures. These are the sort of nobbles of, of the spine uh, on very thin people. I'll show you mine, covered in a layer of fat. So, uh, it, the cervical vertebrae are the ones in your neck and there are two particular bones that do not have that standard vertebra structure. Uh, the top one is the atlas and it's effectively um, a ring of bone. It doesn't have that vertebral body it's got a nice big hole down the middle, um, but it is just a ring of bone. It doesn't have those sort of characteristic bits. It does have uh, little holes to each side and a big hole down the middle, but it is just a ring of bone. And it's called the atlas bone because it supports the skull. A bit like Atlas had the world on his shoulders in Greek mythology. The, Next bone down is the axis bone, 
and the axis bow, I mean, it's quite tricky to see, that has this little sort of peg sticking up called an odontoid process and that articulates with the atlas bone so that you can make this sort of movement. So you can do this and you can do this. So it allows you to move your head around on that top bit of the vertebra whereas the, the normal vertebrae wouldn't allow you to do that. So, structurally, these are your neck bones. And obviously your heart is kind of, you know, beating at about where this bit is here. And the blood vessels are emerging from the heart and they need to go up to the brain. So the key characteristic of these uh, C vertebrae C3 through to 7 is that you've got these holes right down the side for the blood vessels to travel through from the heart to the brain. Nice and protected, you don't want anything happening to those. Disrupt the blood supply to the brain and uh, probably that's not a very good thing. We have a, a triangular and really quite large vertebral foramen. Now that is the hole down the middle where your vertebral cord goes, your spinal cord. So this is the main part of the central nervous system that connects the brain to all the rest of the body. And that is quite large. At the rear then, so at the back, we've got these spinous processes. And the characteristic, and it's not shown brilliantly on our skeleton apart from on that vertebra, are what we call bifurcated. That means they're split into two, so they've got a spinous process bifurcation. And I think that's probably really realistically to stop the overextension of the spinal cord as you tilt your head back. So those are the sort of key characteristics of those vertebrae. And they look quite different from the thoracic vertebrae. Now the thoracic vertebrae are where the ribs are articulated. So we have transverse processes, these processes that stick out, and if you can see on the, on the ribs, they're actually attached, they're articulating, joined together by ligaments with the rib cage. So it's this, that as you breathe in and you're swinging your rib cage up and out, it's swinging against these transverse processes as your sternum lifts up in the breathing movements. The uh, vertebral foramen, sort of as a recognition point more than anything else, is more circular. So in the uh, cervical vertebrae it's quite large and triangular. It's now much smaller and circular. And the spinous processes are longer and not bifurcated at the ends. Notice also that we don't have those transverse foramen either. So the thoracic ones are merely to attach the ribs to and allow them to articulate. So moving to the <coughs> lumbar vertebrae, these are the ones at the base of your back. These are really weight-bearing uh, vertebrae. So they have, you see I've drawn the body in a much more massive way. They've got this massive pedicel in lamina. They're very, very robust uh, to resist the force. These are the ones that are weight-bearing. They are bearing the weight of the, or the entire trunk of your body. Uh, so their, their main characteristic is that they are very robust. Obviously, they've got spinal processes on to hold your back muscles. And they've got a foramen because you still need your spinal cord to be protected by them. So the spinal cord is effectively running where this metal rod is down the middle of the foramen of these vertebrae. Uh, you do need to know about some of the postural deformities associated with the spine. So you may have seen in elderly ladies that they, sit, they appear to almost have a hunch here, sort of at the base of the neck and um, at, at, sort of on the early thoracic vo uh, vertebrae. This is uh, what my grandmother would have called Dowager's Hump. And it's um, a deformity of the spine that's caused by a weakening of the bone. Now that could be uh, one of several reasons. It could be um, this kind of more porous bone in osteoporosis. 
it could be caused by spinal tuberculosis uh, or it could be by a lack of vitamin uh, D and calcium causing rickets in, children, in childhood or the adult form which is called osteomalacia. Uh, if you see anybody very overweight, kind of leaning back with their shoulders pushed back and their bellies sticking out in front of them, and that of course goes for pregnant ladies as well, they often have a more pronounced curve in this lumbar region called lordosis. Obviously with pregnancy that's just it's to counterbalance the weight that you're you're carrying on your abdomen and is very temporary in pregnancy. Um, the one that they uh, emphasize on your syllabus is scoliosis, which is, you know, your spine does have, if you look at it sideways, a natural sort of curve to it, so it's doing that. Scoliosis is a curve sideways, so it's as though the spine is twisted sideways. This is what they thought that, uh, or they're pretty sure that Richard III had scoliosis. It develops um, during a growth spurt after adolescence and then can progress into a, a more severe and painful scoliosis which occasionally can require surgery just because it affects these articulations with the ribs and can cause breathing difficulties on the side where the twist is. So it can sometimes require surgery. Uh, it's thought to be caused by a gene mutation, um, but I think that's as much detail as you would need to actually recall for AO1. So, that's the end of the vertebral column. Ha ah, ha, see what I did there? <laughs>